Hi, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's Q&A session. Uh, this is Q&A number two. Uh, we're focused on community and activation. Our first Q&A uh, will be a fantastic group, and that will be on community. So for any questions that you have, uh, please go ahead and tweet those um, using hashtag sports community or post that to the Google Plus community um, or Google Plus page. Again, hashtag sports community and hashtag sports comp. Uh, like I said, we have a fantastic group. We have uh, four people uh, joining us that's going to focus in on this Q&A session, um, answering questions that have been posted to the Google Plus community uh, in, in the lead-up this week, as well as on Twitter. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off, just make a quick introduction. We have Jan DeLisandro from uh, Backplane. She's the head of business development. We have Cash Rosagi joining us. He's the co-founder and CEO of FanCred. Um, Dan Wade is joining us from Lockerdome. Dan is actually known as the original D Wade. Uh, he's actually got that that handle on hashtag, uh, I mean on Twitter. And then we have Andrew Levine joining us from Sumble Pond, who's the head of strategic partnerships. Um, so Jan, we're going to go ahead and kick it off with you. One of the first questions that we had from the community and that we sourced <laughs> focused on strategies. Uh, what strategies have you found successful in building, building and fostering niche communities within larger fan bases? And if you could give us some examples, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Backplane was a company that was started by Lady Gaga um, and her manager and a couple tech entrepreneurs, including Alex Moore, who's a co-founder of Palantir, which I don't know if you guys know is a big data company that the government's using to track terrorists. But the company really grew out of Lady Gaga's frustration with her inability to connect with fans um, in a true, you know, true manner using existing social networks. She has 50 million followers on Facebook and 40 million on Twitter, but she felt it's a very shallow relationship. She doesn't, she can use those platforms very effectively to broadcast messages to her fans, mm -hmm. but she felt like she couldn't really get to know her fans. She couldn't he hear back from them. She couldn't communicate with them in a two-way manner and had no insights into who they were, where they live, and what content that she was posting was really resonating with them. So that was sort of the, the genesis of the company. And so we've built a platform that, you know, basically both the organizer, and in Lady Gaga's case, Lady Gaga, and the fans will both post content. It gets voted up or down by the users so that you're constantly getting, uh, you know, a feed of... Um, you know, what is the most popular content, what is resonating with the fans. So, um, and then on the back end, you know, for the organizer, we've got a lot of um, tools and data analytics to identify the fans and segment them by, based on interests and um, influencer status, um, et cetera. And so we are also um, providing tools to identify people who share your interests and passions. And with that, you know, uh, over the last year, I joined Backplane about a year ago with the mission of of taking what we built for Lady Gaga to other verticals. So we we now have a deal in place with Nike, who's built a used our tools to build a community around women's fitness. Um, Coca Cola has the first community we've launched with them is around uh, the World Cup, and we've got a deal in place with a Major League Baseball Players Association that we'll be rolling something out for them in the coming months as well. And so that is the idea is that we will enable using baseball as an example. As will allow the 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 players to develop one on one relationships with their fans, allow the fans to get close to the players, to see you know what it is that they they care about, and um, that way. So, going back to the Lady Gaga example, with her 50 million Facebook, 40 million Twitter, we've got about a million fans in LittleMonsters.com, and the but these are the most active fans, and so that's what we're doing is helping you you as a brand or a team or a player identify your most passionate fans and connect with them. Thanks, Jan. Um, next question is going to be for Cash, um, who has introduced us to the fan cred. Cash, as we all know, sports isn't exactly the same, of course, as music or other forms of entertainment. Um, there are other things that vary, even for the athlete or on the sponsorship side, the performance and having to put butts in the seats. Um, so from that perspective and from the fan perspective, um, what is it that makes sports-based communities and fan bases you know, different um, then other than what I stated and, and how that applies to fan cred and what your mission really is. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so I think it fundamentally comes down to really two key characteristics that we've seen when we've been building the different communities on fan cred. And I think the first one is a really deep sense of identity that sports fans have as it pertains to their fanhood for their certain team. 
And the second is the raw emotion that comes with being a sports fan. And so we talk about this a lot at FanCred. You know, typically communities are built around products or causes or events, uh, things that have, uh, that have a large amount of interest from a large amount of people. And so if you look at sports and, and, and if you look at your team as a product, if you look at the team as a product, um, and you consider that product the same way that we use any other product in our life. If I have a phone that doesn't work, I'll throw it away. Or if I have a, a TV that doesn't work, I'll get a new one. That, that sort of theory doesn't necessarily work with teams. We stick with our teams whether or not they lose. And to me, there's something really unique about that. Um, and so, you know, it, usually fans become fans of their teams because of a couple of reasons. One, maybe they're a local team and they grew up becoming a fan of that team. And two, it could be because of a connection they have to that team. Their dad took them to their first Boston Red Sox game, or, they, or they, they sort of remember as part of their identity growing up and being a fan of those teams. And so those are really, really deep sense, uh, senses that people get as it pertains to their fanhood. It becomes a sense of identity. How often do you go and, and you're in another town, or you're at an airport, and you see somebody wearing a hat from your favorite team? You may go up to that person, you may not, but instantly there's this sort of bond that's there that's really, really unique. Um, and I think sports also sort of transcends other types of demographics. It, it, it transcends other types of, of communities. You know, when, when, when a Big Poppy hit the Grand Slam in Game 2 of the World Series this year, the Christian turned around and hugged the Muslim. The, the, the Democrat high-fived the Republican. And it sort of takes... Uh, the demographics that we have and sort of how we how we identify ourselves and takes it to another level. And I think it ultimately comes down to the sense of identity that it brings. I am a Mississippi State Bulldog because I grew up there. And whether or not they win or lose, it might affect me in the short term, but it won't affect me in the long term because what I remember most about being a Mississippi State fan and what I treasure most is the connection that I have and the community that I have with people that I enjoy going to these games to and, and cheering when we win and, and complaining when we lose. And I think that's really, really unique, and, and that's sort of what we've seen on FanCred is that, that community that, that centers around these teams and, and even around these games. But once the game is over and they win or lose, that community doesn't dissipate. It, it just adds on to it. And so I think that's what's really unique, whereas other products in our life the, the, it's the, the, it's, if they work, we'll stick with them, and if they, if they don't work, we'll, we'll throw them away. That's not really the case with sports and, and, and how fans interact with their favorite teams. Thanks, Cash. Um, so the next question will be for Dan, the original D-Wade, as I'm told. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, Dan, have, have you challenged D-Wade uh, to a game of hoops yet? I have not. For your handle? <laughs> I have not, and uh, no one from, from his sort of agency or anything has ever reached out, so I get asked pretty frequently if I've ever thought about selling it. And honestly, they've never made me an offer to consider, so I'm going to keep it for the time being. Uh, so, um, Dan, you have at LockerDome have recently had a pretty, pretty big release for your platform. That's LockerDome 3.0. Um, we had a lot of questions around you know, what is different about 3.0, what it means for the evolution of the product. It would be great if you could just give us a you know, quick synopsis and, and kind of give us the pros and cons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Logarithm 3.0 represents where we always wanted to be but didn't necessarily have the development to get there. Um, after a Series A round, we brought in some of the absolute best developers in the city of St. Louis. Um, we're extremely proud of the product that they've built. From a user standpoint, uh, probably the biggest change is the ability to find the content that you want. Uh, we've been really aggressive in, in attracting not only sports partners, but media partners, uh, really trying to boost the amount of quality content on the site. And uh, using our hashtag discovery system, which I know is, is you know, across multiple platforms now, um, it really helps you connect with uh, any type of content producer, whether that's uh, a favorite athlete that we've gotten on the platform, whether that's uh, your favorite team, whether that's a media company that you happen to like a lot. And we're going to keep uh, striving forward to, to pull in the best content that's out there and make sure that whatever people want to build communities around, we're providing them. We want to give them those nodes that that allow you to, to find other people who share not only your interests, but the depth of your interest. Thank you. Um, next uh, question is going to be from for Andrew Levine. And uh, Andrew, I think often when it comes to community, um, people separate content from community. Um, you know, in terms of their strategic approach. And 
StumbleUpon plays a pretty important role in terms of driving traffic on the web and discovery. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit specifically about the relationship between content and community um, and how exactly you know, StumbleUpon does play a role with that? Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, for us it's a very, very important relationship. Um, and, and it depends oftentimes on who's doing the sharing and, and what the platform is, whether it's friend to friend or publisher to fan. Um, in the publisher scenario, it's really simple. Publishers are going to live and die based on the content they share and how it's presented. So a lot of A-B testing goes into this process. You look at like a Buzzworthy, you look, excuse me, you look at a BuzzFeed, you look at an Upworthy, you look at a Bleacher Report, and these folks are doing just a tremendous job. Um, a sports example, you look at like the Knicks on Instagram, and it's what kind of content are they sharing? You know, what are, what are they sharing in between games? Um, what are they giving unique access to? Uh, what are they getting people to talk about? Uh, and, and how are they driving uh, tune-in during the game? So it's a little bit of, of each of these things. Um, for, for, just, for regular people, I think that what and where they share um, is really, really representative of who they are and, they, and how they want to be perceived. And one thing that StumbleUpon is really good at is surfing these really interesting great nuggets for the first time to people and giving them the ability to share those across their networks. And so uh, we see a lot of outbound sharing from StumbleUpon to the Twitters and Facebooks and LinkedIn's of the world. Uh, we also have the ability to, um, to share content within our ecosystem. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, StumbleUpon offers a product called Lists, and Lists is a way to sort of aggregate uh, content in sort of a, in a chronological order. And so being able to take someone on a stumble journey, and we've seen that the list products used across social media uh, for both publishers and uh, individuals has been really successful. Um, and just to let the group know, uh, 30 minutes, unfortunately, is not a ton of time. So we're halfway through. We're about the 15-minute mark. Um, it'd be great to actually, we, we have three questions or more sourced for, for each of us or for each of you, so it'd be nice to get through those. Um, Jan, one thing that this kind of brings us to is, you know, from a community perspective, uh, Backlane's built some amusing, amazing communities. You mentioned those with, with some of your big brand uh, partners as well. But from a brand perspective, it can be very difficult um, once even a large community is built to active or not necessarily to activate but to <clears throat> you know work with that community in an organic fashion and connect with consumers especially around a specific area so could you explain to us a little bit you know how backlane um, you know, addresses that and how, how backlane does work with brands in terms of communities yeah definitely so there's certain brands that you know naturally represent an interest area you know I mentioned Nike you know obviously when you think of Nike you think of fitness um, with coca-cola you know, what we've done is we've aligned with the communities that we're building for them around their marketing initiatives. So I mentioned the first one is around the World Cup. We're going to be rolling one out around the Olympics. We're going to be doing one for Coke Zero that's focused on gaming. And uh, we've also built one for the uh, Coke collectors. You know, the message to the fans was help us build our digital archives. And so people who are collecting Coke memorabilia have a place to share that with, with one another. Um, so, you know, what, what we've done is we've also, on the tool set, we, we've created tools where it's very organic, you know, content, when content is posted, whether it's posted by the brand or by one of the fans, um, it will usually remain in the top spot for 18 to 24 hours, but then will decay over time unless it gets voted up or down by the users. Um, also, the, the organ, whenever the organizer, um, you know, likes or comments on a post, there's a special star designation. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to show real fan recognition, which is something that's very important both in the sports and the music arena as well as with brands is to be recognized by the athlete, you know, musician or brand that you love. It's, a, it's incredibly empowering for a fan and it's sort of the reason why, you know, people would join and participate in a targeted social network is the opportunity to be recognized and rewarded for your, um, for your fandom. Thank you, Jan. Um, Cash, just want to let you know you're you're actually <laughs> getting a lot of feedback on Twitter representing Bulldog Nation. Um, a lot of proud Bulldogs out there. That's so right. <laughs> That's right. Repping them hard. Um, That's right. So in terms in terms of community and fan cred, I mean we all know that that mobile consumption um, is is through the roof. You know, at this point, more than than half of internet connectivity comes through mobile and you know cons consumption of content. So 
Um, from a fan cred perspective, you know, how, how did that weigh into building the fan cred product? Um, and as you look at, at your platform and what you're providing to, to consumers and fans, um, you know, what, what role that plays in the community? Sure. I mean, I think the premise behind FanCred is that we believe that there are communities centered around teams um, around the world. And so uh, what we are trying to do is, is really help those communities interact and, and, and stay connected. And so we've thought long and hard about how do you build communities. And I think it fundamentally you can simplify that into really two areas. First is discovery. Are we able to identify, curate, and introduce the best people for you that match your interests and your backgrounds. Can we introduce that to you? So when you come in to FanCred and let's say you're a New York Giants fan, can we give you the best people and content immediately to sort of satisfy your thirst as a New York Giants fan? And can we do that for all the teams that you're a fan of? So the first is discovery. And social media does a really good job of allowing us to do that, to understand user behavior, to understand the trends that a, that a fan has. and, and create a better recommendation engine in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, discovery. And the second part is connection. Are we able to connect you with those people at any time of the day, at any moment? And so what we've seen at FanCred is that people get introduced and they come into FanCred and they're using it as a platform to stay connected, but it really is not just centered around games. People are connected throughout the day, uh, but, it really, but what happens is during games they really do congregate. And what's really interesting with the use of mobile is now they're able to stay connected and A, maybe they didn't even know each other 10 minutes ago, and B, they could be thousands of miles apart. And so we've made a very explicit decision to go out mobile first and allow people to come into FanCred. We'll do the hard work and heavy lifting of introducing them to a curated list of people that could really provide them a great experience around their teams. And now through the use of mobile, they're connected and they can watch these games together and they can talk about the games afterwards and beforehand. And now you have sort of an instant community that's really, really deep. And so I think mobile plays a really, really uh, core part of that strategy. But it fundamentally comes down to discovery and connection. And that's something we're trying to become really, really good at. And Cash, just a quick quick question to add on to that. Do you do you see FanCred remaining um, a mobile product for the time being? Um, I mean, there have been it was you know over a year before Instagram even contemplated you know a, a web presence. Um, sure. Just curiosity. Sure. No, I mean I think so. So what we did was we actually did launch a web presence um, a couple of months ago that we're really happy about. So I mean what we think about at FanCred is that yes, mobile usage is through the roof, and every trend that you see and all the data that you see points to more and more mobile consumption. But I also think it would be really naive to, to, to completely ignore web usage, especially among sports fans that are at their desk all day. Um, and so we did build a web presence. We're going to continue focusing on that. But I mean, rest assured, the, you know, as a company, we're really focused on mobile and, and making it easier for you to interact and connect and discover other fans no matter where you are. Um, so with regard to, to LockerDome, Dan, um, and, and Cash touched on this and touched on it quite well. Uh, you know, sports is such an intense um, rallying around interest, and it transcends. And, and so, from that regard, do you think that an interest-based community, and we had a lot of questions on this, um, is stronger at its core than relation-based communities like a social network? Um, you know, do, what do you see as the, the strengths being in terms of an interest-based community? You know, social networks have a lot of power. Facebook wouldn't be the behemoth they are if those connections didn't matter a lot to us. But those connections tend to be something that we can kind of, I don't want to say take for granted because that's not right, but something that we can we can have a good relationship with and we can deal with sort of intermittently and, and not necessarily feel the need to check every day or multiple times a day to make sure that those those relationships are, are where we want them to be. With an interest-based community, it takes up just a lot of your free time. If you're, you know, you've got five minutes waiting for a bus, are you more likely to call a parent or, you know, quick check Twitter and see what's going on with the the uh, the topics that you care about? Are you more likely to, you know, shoot texts to your friends or are you more likely to go on Locker Dome and see what an athlete like Mary Fitzgerald is talking about? And the answer to those questions will sort of determine which type of community is going to be stronger for you. For example, I don't use Facebook all that often. You know, it's just not where I'm very interested in. But I'm I'm obviously on Locker Dome every day, and that's kind of a given. Uh, but I also have a you know a, 
a Twitter community that I've curated over you know the last four or five years with people I really care about. And so even though I've never met them, I wouldn't be able to identify them in a lineup. We have the same interests, and so that's where that bonding point is really strong. And with the new Locker Dome, what we're giving people is the chance to form those relationships around the, the types of content, whether it's video or text or you know an Instagram photo that we're getting, getting pulled in, around that content. So not only is it a piece of content they like, but they can have a conversation with people who also really care deeply about that topic. And, and Andrew, um, you know, on that note, from what Dan was, was speaking on, um, and for, you know, from your perspective, talk about interest-based and types of content. You know, of course, there's type of content topically. You know, your favorite team, player, uh, moment. There's also the content type itself. Um, and I, you know, stumble upon at this point has a massive amount of data. But from a sports perspective, um, you know, are there certain types of content specifically as it relates to sports that you really see generating a lot of community? Um, things like, um, you know, memes and gifs obviously are, are a rallying point for a lot of people and there's dedicated resources, but from a stumble upon perspective, um, how's that really driven community? Sure, and from a stumble upon perspective, you know, the, the stumbling experience tends to be more um, individual focused, um, although you are, of course, able to dive deep into a topic, whether that's sports, whether that's American football or search by a, a, a team. Just to sort of address content sort of at large, though, across social and how that fosters community, um, I guess I'll bar borrow a bit from, like, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know. It's, it, it's, it's content that gives people real value, and it's content that fosters meaningful conversation. So I'm wearing, like, a Blues jersey. And so if the Blues are showing <clears throat> flashbacks from the past that remind me of my youth or giving me a little bit of a nugget for a game that's coming up, um, those are things that provide value for me. Um, things that, you know, I might pick up the phone and call my dad because I remember being in a game and seeing something, or call a friend or tweet to a friend about something relevant to an upcoming game. Um, largely, you know, the other thing around content just across the web, uh, one, it needs to be, of course, optimized for platform, and two, uh, we're only getting more, more and more mobile, so uh, optimizing for mobile is, uh, of course, really, really relevant. Um, just content, again, sort of at large, uh, the things that we're seeing foster best community uh, are things that are shareable, things that are opinionated, that, that you know, people have to take a side and, and, and own, own the side of the argument. Um, it's emotional content. It's things that are getting people to laugh, getting people to think, or awing people. And, and these are really the same kinds of content that do really well on StumbleUpon. Uh, they're the content on StumbleUpon that gets the thumb up. Um, and ultimately gets uh, shared across the web. So we have um, about five or six minutes left in the QA session. I kind of just wanted to open it up a little bit to the group as a whole. Um, there's been a number of different questions around you know, hashtags, uh, our namesake of our events, hashtag sports. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of hashtags, it, it, each platform integrates with other social uh, media platforms in different manners. They use that to pull real-time conversation, and sort, and curate. Um, but from a from a hashtag perspective, and in terms of community, um, hashtags can generate large levels of conversation. But there can also be a lot of white noise. Um, how do you see hashtags potentially evolving in terms of use, or you know, data mining and growth as it relates to to community? Um, just kind of an open question to the group. Um, sure. I'll jump in. Somebody's got to go. Um, one thing we're doing is uh, paying attention to uh, which hashtags are getting chained together. So everything that's hashtagged MLB, for example, you're, you're going to get a lot of white noise in there, um, especially as you look. And, and there are you know, common hashtags between teams. If you're hashtagging something giant in the month of September, you could be talking New York, you could be talking San Francisco, all that kind of stuff. So what we're looking at is how many hashtags are being used on a given post, how can we weight those so that when someone searches giants, we can present them essentially two forks of contents. Content that's hashtag NFL, hashtag giants, or hashtag MLB, hashtag giants. And these also include things like San Francisco versus New York, et cetera. So looking beyond that single tag is, is where we're really looking at that problem. Now, when we're, what we're doing on our end is, um, we're tracking the hashtags to um, serve up personalized feeds. 
so that of the and and also uh, identifying people who you might also want to follow who are following the same hashtags that you are. So it allows um, you know for an even deeper level of conversation within the community um, based on you know people being able to track which interests very specifically um, they're following. Um, I'll quickly just uh, jump in. I mean, I think uh, everything that they've said is true. I mean, from our perspective, we've taken a little bit of a different approach in that um, hashtags are very powerful in that it can obviously generate a lot of momentum and people can contribute. But for us, it's not as much about the number of content or the number of people participating as it is the quality of content and who those people are and why I should listen to them. And so our approach has been a little bit different in that We've structured communities around teams, and what we're trying to do through our fan credit score is bring to the top the content that's most engaged with, that's most interacted with, and the people that are that are providing that content. So I think hashtags are a great way to throw information out and, and begin a conversation. I don't think they're necessarily a great way to bring the best to the top and allow me as a consumer, when I only have a certain amount of space on my phone or on my desk, and I'm getting all this content at once, how do I know what content to interact with? And most importantly, how do I know who to interact with? And so I don't think hashtags really do solve that problem, uh, whereas we're approaching it a little bit differently with our fan credit score to measure the engagement you're getting on all the content you provide and your activity as a user. And for us, um, StumbleUpon is a hashtag-free uh, platform. So what we're really looking at, uh, at hashtags through the lens of social uh, listening to help inform our product decisions, our marketing decisions, um, our public relations decisions, et cetera. And so um, one quick comment on that. I've been told that hashtag sports comp is trending today uh, on Google+. Plus. So we've all been doing our part and hopefully have done here as well in community. So we do need to wrap it up, but if we could just quickly go down the line, um, I'd love for, for each of the Q&A uh, participants here just to leave us with a parting thought. Um, Jade, you can kick us off. Um, I, so one of the questions you asked earlier, I think, is you know key to this this whole Q and A panel is that you know is there a need for interest based communities? Um, and we believe, as I think most people on this panel do, that 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 that's the direction that we're going. That Facebook is an incredible platform that was was built to connect you with your friends, and it's you know that I think that at this level, people um, there is so much noise out there. And when you log into Facebook, you often see a lot of things you don't really care about, like what your friend's kid had for lunch or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and so the, for the need to be able to go in and connect with people who share your interests and passion, um, where you can join, you know, I'm a New York Giants fan. I'm also a, an avid skier, um, a dog lover, you know, a mom, many other things. But the, you know, what I'm going to talk about in a mom community is going to be very different than what I'm going to talk about in a New York Giants-focused community. So I think that um, there absolutely is a need for it, and we're seeing, you know, hopefully we'll be seeing more and more of this. Um, yeah, I can go. So I mean, I think I'll piggyback off of what Jan said. I mean, I think people always talk about the relevancy and um, does sports deserve its own vertical in terms of how fans interact? Can't you just do it on Facebook or can't you just do it on Twitter? And what we like to talk about is the history of how as a culture we've consumed sports content. And if you go back a hundred years, two hundred years, you know, the way that they were interacting about sports, it was print and then it turned into sports print. And then there was radio and then they turned into sports radio. And you have TV and now you have 24 hours of dedicated TV and then you have more verticals within sports TV. And so the way that we see fans interacting and consuming sports content, I'm not necessarily sure that there should be a vertical for every type of content and every type of vertical, but there definitely deserves to be a, a, a vertical just for sports. And I think there's a massive opportunity for an organization, for a company to come in and completely build the world's largest sports community. And that's really what we're seeking to do. Our mission is to, is to connect the world's sports fan and build the largest sports community in the world. And I think there's a massive opportunity out there. I'll jump in. I think one of the things we're most excited about with our new platform, with Locker Dome 3.0, is seeing uh, who sports fans are beyond the face paint and the, the foam finger. Um, sports fans are amazingly passionate people, and they are the base of who we are as a company, but they also have diverse interests beyond their favorite teams. They have favorite players who play for somebody else. They love their own fantasy teams. Beyond that, they're music fans. They're, they're athletes themselves, and 
what we've been really excited and what we've gotten to see in the, the month or so since we released the new platform is just how complex people are. And that's a really fun thing to see is, is you know, you're wearing a, a Barcelona jersey in your profile pic, so from that I can deduce, hey, you're probably a Barcelona fan, but you're not from Spain, you're from Egypt, and you have all of these passions. And so uh, the interest-based communities, I think, are a wonderful way for not only people to connect with each other who share their interests, but with great content, but also to sort of assert their individuality of, hey, I'm not just a Barca fan, I'm so much more than that. And we're, we're really excited to see where what, what lessons we can learn from that and where that'll take us. Yeah, and... Uh... We're, we're also really excited about interest-based communities and, uh, you know, interests have helped build our platform. We're also really, really excited to be launching a uh, mobile video product that's really interest-centric. So uh, that's going to be happening later this month. And so, again, we, we, we believe uh, deeply that, that there's a place um, for interest-based communities, and uh, uh, we're excited to unveil our product and see what everyone else is, uh, is building in uh, 2014. Thank you, uh, Andrew, D. Wade, Jan, Cash. Appreciate the conversation. It's been, it's been great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the QA session as well. Um, our next QA session will be focused on activation. Uh, if you could stay tuned, uh, we'll be live here shortly. All right, getting uh, Q and A second part of Q and A session here loaded up. Um, again, if you have any questions in addition to our conversation, the hashtag is hashtag Sports Activation. Um, as you saw with the last group, we tried to feed in some questions outside of the, the Q and A, so I'd like to do the same here. Um, so, do we have everybody in? All right, um, joining us right now uh, for the activation Q&A session uh, is Abel Koskelly. Uh, he's the co-founder of Pogo Seat. We also have Chris Mike uh, from Tripify. He's the VP of Accounts joining us. And William Corbin, uh, the VP of Digital from Octagon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so we had a you know, great Q&A discussion focused on community in the last um, session. We're going to be focusing on activation, um, as, as I just described. And Chris, I really wanted to start with you in terms of Chirpify. Um, there's a lot of discussion around in the community, uh, discussion um, in terms of interest-based communities. And in terms of Chirpify, love to just start off a little bit high level and tell us what Chirpify does um, just in general and, and through your action, action tags and how that in and of itself is interest-based. Yeah, absolutely. So I think in the last session, you guys kind of touched on a lot of what we think about day in and day out here at Chirpify, but um, we're really, uh, I think most simply explained, we're an automated platform that activates hashtags uh, for commerce and, and marketing conversion for brands. Um, you know, we have a saying around here, hashtags are the new URL. Um, they're everywhere. Um, you can't find a team, a campaign, an event, an athlete in sports that doesn't have a hashtag associated with it. And we think that's great. Um, we think hashtags, again, per the conversation uh, in the last segment, we think hashtags are fabulous for curating conversation. But the problem is they don't actually do anything for a brand um, other than that, than that curation, which is valuable, but, but the real value, we think, um, goes much further than that. Um, and that's really about automating the process of letting consumers purchase and participate with brands via social posts. Um, and that allows marketers to amplify and drive conversion for their campaigns, whether they are off and online. Um, you know, a, a hashtag doesn't have to, and as I think we've all seen, doesn't have to exist just in a tweet or in a post. I was walking around Times Square the other day, and probably 70% of the billboards out there had hashtags on them, um, which is great if you want to follow a conversation. But again, what value do they really provide the brand? Um, and we think that brand, that that value uh, is about giving brands the ability to collect uh, data, and that was touched on a little earlier, collect data from consumers, um, and then drive revenue and commerce um, via the activation of those hashtags. So my team, 
uh, works with our clients to uh, understand how to ar architect and leverage our platform to drive that value for the clients, whether they decide that that value is about data collection or whether they want to set up um, or, or grow a database of, of fans who they can frictionlessly transact with. Thank you, Chris. I, I think you touched on some, some really interesting points there. Um, I believe Abel might have dropped off, so um, we'll try to, try to get him back online. But um, Will, as it relates to you know what Chris was talk, you know, touching on in terms of the value of hashtags and you know, seeing seeing those uh, out in the public with every advertisement, um, you know, Octagon is a leader a leader in activation and sports sponsorship. So, uh, how how does Octagon approach especially multi-channel activations? I mean, that can be a, a, a large challenge for a sponsor, um, especially when they're trying to achieve uh, a certain amount of reach around a large event uh, in particular. Uh, what you know? What what role does social media play in that, especially from you know a campaign perspective, as it relates to um, multi-channel activation? You got it. You know, definitely, uh, social media is playing a bigger and bigger role. Um, obviously, our brands are demanding that it be part of every activation they do. Um, I want to say historically, which call it you know only a few years ago. Uh, social media was really a way for them to extend their activations beyond the physical boundaries of the activation uh, and make that event or what they were doing sort of live beyond its physical boundaries and live in the social media universe and get bigger reach and increased awareness. Uh, today what we're seeing more and more is obviously brands are using hashtags in a sort of curated way around their events. But the other thing we're seeing is we're starting to use hashtags to be able to identify the brand advocates, the people who are speaking about the brand both negatively and positively, uh, ideally positively. But so we're able to actually, by people's use of hashtags out there using listening tools, start to filter out who is who can be you know, sort of energized or utilized as a brand advocate. Somebody's already speaking positively about the brand or speaking positively about the specific activation we're doing. And then we try to say, okay, how can we leverage this individual or group of individuals to really communicate our message to their downstream? Because ultimately, I call it the rotten tomatoes effect. It is that referral that is getting the you know conversion that we really, really want around the activation. And, and Will, just to, to piggyback on that very quickly, um, there have been articles that have surfaced in you know last year or two saying digital marketing should no longer be called digital marketing, it's marketing. Um, I mean, at this point, are there sports uh, sponsorship activations that don't encompass um, social media or digital in, in any way, shape, or form? I'd argue there are not very many successful ones. Um, you got to be touching all the channels. You got to be where all the people are. Um, the day of the, you know, people calling it a two-screen environment, I call it a one-screen. It's your, you know, it's your handset, it's your tablet, and then the TV is just really the big screen environment for it. But uh, to think anybody's watching sports or engaging with music or entertainment or even culinary, which is the space we now play in, and that they are not uh, doing so engaging through their social media networks at the same time, you're missing the boat. Um, the reality is they are engaging with their social media networks at the same time they're engaging with the content. They're often talk obviously engaging around the content. And so you have to make sure your presence is in that space with them at that time. Um, it's almost a box that just gets checked automatically. Uh, you know, I, I, I've not been to an event, I'd say, in the past year and a half where social media wasn't prevalent. Um, it Abel, I think we have you back online. Yep. Uh, great to have you. And, you know, Chris kicked us off, I, I thought, pretty well. Um, I thought hashtags was a, you know, a real great you know, focal point. And one of the key words he hit on was purchase um, and, and, you know, drive in action. Pogo Seat, um, and for one, specializes in in-game seat upgrades. Um, so if you just walk us through a little bit, like, what that means, uh, you know, especially for activation from a sponsor perspective, uh, as well as just the in-game live experience. Right. Uh, so we, we give sports teams and musicians the ability to let their fans upgrade their seats and, and uh, really engage into a unique experience. Um, and, and really, uh, this is a product of the mobile consumer. Of, <laughs> you know, 75% of fans at a live entertainment event having a smartphone and actually being on that smartphone during the event. They want to have additional engagement and additional things um, 
going on when they're at, whether it's a, a sports event or a concert. Uh, and so we, we give these sports teams a way to actually do that and present a, a sort of deeper connection uh, to the event, to the team, and, and a more satisfying experience, which ultimately leads to fan loyalty and, and longevity of, of, of those fans. Um, doing that not only gives the fans an opportunity to have an incredible experience and um, sort of go over the top with, uh, with their, their time there once they're actually at a game, um, it also gives the teams um, a better understanding of their fans. And so, you know, how, how do these fans behave? What, what can we give them uh, to make their experience more enjoyable? Um, you know, and, and really it comes down to how do we actually personalize and target um, to these fans what they want um, versus uh, just the old marketing of just blast, blast something out via an ad. And I think fans and, and, and consumers in general, they do want an offer personalized to them. Um, and they do want to feel like it's something that they are interested in. Uh, and so so we, we find out a bit about these, these fans, and, and it can lead into um, some really interesting um, ups, additional upsell opportunities, uh, like with season ticket sales uh, down the road. Thank you, Abel. Um, Chris, so you know, specifically focusing on <laughs> hashtags and, and action and, and driving commerce, that's one area I'm particularly interested in. Um, in terms of driving commerce, you know, have you found you have a lot of experience at this point? Your Turbify is multi-platform. Is is a challenge? Um, you know, through your platform, and the way that you're using hashtags as the new URL to drive commerce on one platform, social platform versus another. Um, yeah, I think each each platform has its own sort of um, set of rules that we have to operate within. Um, uh, and each of those environments pro pose different challenges for commerce. Um, I will say that what seems to work the best uh, in our experience and sort of framing it in a sports environment is, is using social and using hashtags to activate or to drive commerce opportunities around limited supply or exclusive merchandise. So I think Jan um, you know, mentioned Lady Gaga and the types of things that she was doing for to, to drive her fan base earlier. We've done campaigns for her as well, um, selling unique merchandise packages. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with artists because um, they have large social followings that they're looking to monetize. Um, and you know, finding ways to sell remixes or limited uh, merchandise packs. Um, you know, for a sports team, that might be limited jerseys. Um, or a special deal on a particular piece of merchandise. Um, things that are things that are are not meant to replace an e-commerce opportunity, but meant to be time sensitive and unique. Those seem to work extremely well. Um, another angle that we think is is probably even more effective in commerce is using hashtags to identify people who want to raise their hand and say, "Yeah, I'm interested in this idea," and then moving them further down the funnel. Um, um, so in that model, we're, we're about more about a participation and response. The consumer can participate with the brand wherever he or she may be, um, outside, uh, watching their first screen, their TV, or in venue, and they can participate by tweeting a particular hashtag. We could then respond to them from the brand and, as I mentioned, move them further down the funnel by providing them a promo code or some sort of coupon that would allow them to actually go and f fulfill a purchase. So in that instance, driving commerce is more about helping people get to a particular destination to buy versus actually transacting the sale at that moment, um, if that makes sense. No, it does. Uh, and, I, and I think that leads in well to Will. Um, you know, in terms of sports sponsorship and activation, um, Chris touched on you know, moving down the funnel. Um, and Part of that is loyalty. So you know, often it can be difficult with a sponsor. There's an initial activation, uh, maybe around a big event like Sochi 2014 Olympics um, or the, the World Cup this coming summer. Um, how does Octagon you know, work with its, its partners and its clients to, to keep fans engaged um, you know, through a campaign or th through other, you know, maybe it's a digital platform or whatever it may be, keep them engaged and loyal after that initial uh, you know, activation? Or, or is that something that, that brands aren't really 
uh, coming to you with as a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's a mix. Some brands are very interested in their customer loyalty. Let's say other brands might not be as interested. Um, you know, one the thing that almost all the brands are doing, and they're viewing social media as a mechanism to do that, is they really are saying, okay, if we're looking into social media, first is giving them an opportunity to listen. You know, as marketers, for years and years, we used to always scratch our heads and say, geez, if we could just get a mind to the consumer. Well, social media gives you that window into the mind of the consumer. And so the brands that we see on our side, they're doing it really, really successfully, are the ones who are getting that lens into the mind of the consumer and then using what the consumer is saying often about their products or their services to help guide how they're going to market to them, as well as, you know, like I said, mining that downstream of those advocates for their br of the brands. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's funny because social media has really transitioned uh, marketers. We used to be, you know, communicating to the masses as marketers, and now we're faced with a mass of communicators. Everybody is communicating with everybody, and uh, so especially in the World Cup, you know, social media luckily transcends the borders, the physical boundaries of our countries very quickly, um, and so it's it's you know the world what the World Cup is making all of our brands think about is, okay, we're not just talking to a U.S. audience, we're not just talking to a Brazilian audience, um, how in social media are we really talking to this world audience, and then how are we listening to this world audience and adjusting our messaging to the various niches that we're seeing across social media landscape across the entire world? I hope that answers the question. No, it definitely does answer the question. I, I thought there's a lot of great points there. Um, you can take the conference, for example. We, we were shocked just in terms of shareability. I think we reached close to 70 countries, and much of that is hashtag-driven. Um, so it is truly international reach. Obviously, when you're talking about um, you know, a sponsorship opportunity like World Cup or Sochi 2014. But, um, yes, it, it did. Thank you, Will. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's keeping okay. it relevant. So it, it's, you know, it's amazing how hashtags will clearly keep something relevant. Like, I'm sitting here talking to you guys, and I've already gotten... Uh, hit on the hashtag based on a comment I said from somebody and it's like that immediacy especially for a brand and that immediate interaction with your consumers is just something that's never been able to be done before and it's so valuable to the brands. So the brands are willing to listen to it um, and there are, there are smart brands. So. And Abel, um, you know, Chris mentioned raising, you know, consumer raising their hand and you know, Will talked about immediacy in terms of social media. Um, Pogo seat, you know, certainly gets people to raise their hand. Um, there's an initial upgrade, maybe it's on a seat, but but what are you doing, you know, after that initial raise of the hand? Um, how are you continuing to, you know, work with the team or the venue uh, to continue to bring value after that initial uh, upgrade or interaction with Pogo seat? You know, that long-term value or, or short-term right. value. Right. Yeah. So right off the bat, we want to deliver even more value to that fan who upgraded their seat. So, for example, uh, we're working on a partnership with one of the largest live entertainment um, concession vendors to, to provide a free drink or free food item like a hot dog on the digital ticket that we generate for someone once they upgrade. So once they upgrade, they, they get up from their seat, they're moving to a, another seat, they pass by the concessions, they stop by, they have a free item they can redeem. Um, so now they're getting a better seat, they have, they're getting fed, a better experience. Uh, and then lastly, um, we also, you know, we want to be able to provide them with not just a seat upgrade, but also an experience upgrade. So maybe once they get to their new seat, they can then, on demand, um, you know, order the mascot to come visit their seat and sign an autograph for, for their son. Um, they can, you know, find other sort of uh, exclusive um, type access experiences like running the bases after a game, uh, things like that where they continue to further engage with the team and the team uh, in, in turn gets to deepen that relationship with their fan uh, which does increase the long term loyalty and, and of course it turns that fan into a marketer for them talking about how great of an experience they had at the game. Uh, so so that's, that's a big one and, and I think you know from what we're seeing fans they do want to engage more. They do want to engage more deeply with the team, with the players, you know, at the event, even with other fans. And so we're working on, on, on those things. Um, additionally, uh, there's the data play. And, and so, uh, w you know, we collect data on, on what these fans want uh, and then, you know, share it with the team so that the team can then 
in turn provide them you know very personalized offers. Um, so I mentioned um, you know using using the data to sell season tickets. Um, you know, so if a fan upgrades four times over the course of a season and three times it's to section 112, well, the team probably should reach out and say, it looks like you liked section 112. You know, we've got a special we're doing on, on this. We can, you know, let's, let's get you a package of tickets, whether that's season tickets or um, a mini pack. You know, and, and the results so far have been encouraging. Um, with the Golden State Warriors last season, they generated over $100,000 in new season ticket sales just from the data that we provided them, and, and, and they went out and were able to actually target what their fans wanted and serve that up to them and, you know, and actually see a, a, an extremely high conversion on that. Thank you, uh, Abel. Chris, um, I think something to be particularly interesting, you know, between questions that I, that I saw posted in the community and just questions that are coming in now in general, um, there's a lot of thought that goes into hashtags uh, or should from a marketing perspective. We've talked about how it's like the new URL. Um, but could you give us an example, you know, a real world example of, of kind of a, chirp, a short and chirpified case study? Uh, I think it'd be really valuable for, for you know, people listening to kind of get a better idea um, of a tangible example, you know, maybe something that's driven a lot of value in the last six months. Sure. Um, well, there, there are a number. Um, uh, I'll, do, I'll give you a sort of two different examples. Um, one is um, Sprint, uh, a client of ours. Um, they're about collecting data. So the value that they understand or the value that they want to realize is um, a better understanding of who their potential customers are um, and email addresses for database marketing, uh, social handles for better, smarter, targeted social ads. Um, so they did a simple um, giveaway in, on social channels where you could tweet to enter a, um, a giveaway for a number of smartphones. Um, a lot of companies do this. This is not completely a new idea. The, the issue is most of the time, uh, the way companies execute this is they'll say, hey, tweet this hashtag and be entered to win something. They'll use a listening service that, that Will mentioned earlier that, that will aggregate all those tweets, and then they'll pick a winner. And that's the extent of the value. The value that they get there is amplification. Um, but when Chirpify helps a company like Sprint do that campaign, we'll say tweet with a particular set of hashtags. Um, anybody that tweets using those hashtags, we collect one important piece of data for them, which was their social handle. So the next time they're going out and buying promoted tweets, they're able to buy more targeted promoted tweets. Um, the second piece of data that we collect, uh, because as soon as somebody tweets that, we automatically, uh, at scale, at message them um, in Twitter, uh, we'll collect their email address and any other information that that brand wants to collect. So for teams or entities or brands that are into data collection, um, this is a tremendous platform. So not only do you get the amplification of the tweet being the, the method for entry, you also get the opportunity to collect valuable data from that, from that person. So what we've really done is turned, turned sort of these promotions on their side and said, hey, do what you're doing already, but collect a ton of extra data from that exact same exercise. And that data is super valuable brands like Sprint. Um, we do a lot of the same work with Adidas football, where just for giving out a simple pair of cleats, one pair of cleats, they're able to collect thousands of email addresses that they then port into their CRM system and their, their database marketing system, which continues to crank out value um, as they launch new product. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have about a little under five minutes left, um, but I, I have some really interesting questions I want to get through to, uh, to both you, Will, and Abel. Uh, Will, one question on my mind, and I've also seen a question coming in through, through Twitter and Google+, uh, with the hashtag sports activation hashtag, is how, you know, there, there's a lot of restriction now around activation, especially as it relates to digital. There have been a lot of headlines with Sochi 2014 and, and the Russian government. Um, big events also take different approaches to it. Uh, it seems to me, just kind of my personal observation, it tends to be a little more, uh, less regulation around the World Cup in terms of enforcing and stopping other sponsors from guerrilla activations. But, you know, from your perspective and, and from the perspective of digital, is it really realistic? Um, and are we going to continue to see these, these big events really try to fight um, against digital in terms of guerrilla tactics um, and even the use by, by athletes?
I mean, I... <clears throat> I think you have to tread very carefully uh, when waging the war against the will of the public. Um, the recording industry <laughs> learned it the hard way, I'd say. Um, I think a lot of the leagues are being very smart about which battles they are fighting. I mean, realistically, none of us can tweet anything saying the word Super Bowl or Olympic, uh, even out of a personal account. Um, is that realistic? No. Um, but, you know, it's like why Jeep always has to say trademark of Chrysler Corporation after they say their name because it, you know, these brands do have a lot of equity built up in, or the leagues have a lot of equity built up in their brands as leagues and they do have to constantly defend that so I totally understand that. Um, are they going to go after uh, a kid who tweets the word Olympics? Not likely. Um, but you always do have to try to put out your guidelines and state your beliefs so that it is public and out there. Um, you know, the World Cup, I think FIFA is definitely one of the best at policing their brands, actually, and, um, you know, you want people talking about it, you want people talking about your brand, it makes, makes these events so big, but uh, ultimately I think you have to sort of acquiesce to the will of the public to some extent. Uh, Abel, we have about two minutes left. Um, we have a large international audience, a large amount of um, folks from around the world actually watching right now. And so I thought it'd be interesting to ask a question as it relates to Pogo Seat about potentially just the nature of the game being different in the, in the American market, uh, the way sports happen in live venue uh, versus abroad, um, and you know what challenges that prevent presents for Pogo Seat and, and potentially even what opportunities. Sure, uh, you know I, I think uh, connectivity is a big one. Obviously, uh, for us, uh, you know we we prefer to have connectivity at the event when it's at capacity full of fans we can operate without it and open up upgrades the morning of the of the game and before there's a large group of fans in one place and, and, and bandwidth goes down what we've seen though is, is in the US um, you know we're somewhere between a third and a half of the venues in the US and especially um, sports sports teams uh, venues they do have really good connectivity. They've made investments in Wi-Fi. They've made investments in, in, in bolstering out their bandwidth. Um, international is a little further behind. Um, you know, and so the, you know, they're getting there, though, and, and, and following the U.S.'s example. And, and internationally, uh, you know, international football is a huge sport, the number one sport in the world. Um, so very interesting. We've been talking to a few EPL teams and, and some of the, uh, the international football teams, and the fans are extremely passionate. Uh, you know, there's a, a slight leg in the connectivity technology, but it's definitely getting there. And some of the leaders in, in those sports leagues are actually already up and running, full, uh, full connectivity and bandwidth. Um, is the other thing with international, and, and you know, uh, Will mentioned it earlier with global brands. Um, you know, they want to be in the game, you know, across all their customer base. And one of those places is at live entertainment and, and sports events. Uh, so, you know, fans at a game, how do you engage those fans? How do you, you know, actually, you know, and I think we're at the early stages of this, uh, how do you put out a real-time mobile interactive campaign that's just, that's not advertising at, just at someone, it's actually engaging them and giving them something of value. So, you know, brands want to, you know, reward th their customer loyalty by surprising and delighting their customers. Um, you know, you can do that with an upgrade in real life. And then, in turn, you're also back to the data play. You're getting data on that customer and what they want. Uh, you know, you might offer them a few different experiences and see what they go with. Uh, you, you start understanding they're they're going to these games with their son, or they're going with their college buddies, or you know, a, a different kind of audience. Um, and so, you know, once you figure out exactly what those customers want, you know, these brands and the and the sports teams can do a better job of giving it to them. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you can also drive desired actions from from your customers, and, and especially at a sports game, um, you know, asking someone to socially share their experience with your brand on Twitter or on Facebook and, and at the team and at the brand is great. It, you know, a lot of brands are starting to look more and more towards peer-to-peer -to -peer marketing and customer advocacy uh, in terms of their marketing and advertising budget versus um, the old model. And so we think that's great, and it also allows the brand to really deepen the relationship, um, you know, and, and provide a customer something of value versus just seeing an ad at them. And 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 you know, through certain unique positioning and certain offerings, they can differentiate 
in their positioning versus competitors, um, which is very valuable as well. And so all those things, we, we think um, you know, there's a huge opportunity in, in uh, live sports games uh, at the venue to actually activate those fans um, and, and, one, increase their loyalty to your brand, um, two, turn them into marketers for you, and, and, you know, and to in turn get more customers who are their friends. Um, on behalf of the hashtag SportsConf, I'd like to say uh, thank you to, to Chris, Will, Abel. Clearly, we did not have enough time. I think one of my takeaways is Q&A needs more time next year because there's been some fantastic questions I think have been borne out. Uh, I'd like to also say thank you again to Jan, Cash, uh, Dan, and Andrew. Um, and thank you for joining us. And please also continue to uh, engage with our speakers in the hashtag SportsConf uh, private community um, as well on Twitter. Thank you, everybody.